Al, I know you've been talking a great deal about our democracy. What's happened to it? Well, it's been hacked. That's a computer term when the operating system of a computer is taken over and the computer is forced to do things that the owner doesn't want it to do. That's what's been happening to American democracy. For example, you have 90% of the people in favor of background checks for gun purchases, and the Congress is incapable of doing what the American people want. They haven't been able to regulate these uh, phony baloney financial derivatives that caused the financial crisis. Uh, they voted to invade Iraq, uh, even though Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. Unfortunately, there are lots of examples. They can't pass a budget. They can't keep the country from facing uh, financial uh, danger. And the, the main reason is pretty simple. The influence of big money is at extremely unhealthy levels. Now, you point to all of the regulations. You've also said that have not come to pass. You've also said that not a single meaningful reform in the best interest of the American public will be passed by this Congress. Why not? Well, no meaningful reform that affects any powerful special interest can pass unless that special interest, first of all, gives its permission for regulation or for reform. And it's because of the influence of special interests wielding large campaign contributions and financing lobbyists and using the revolving door now have way more influence over the decisions of the Congress than the American people do. Uh, there have been times in American history when the influence of special interests was very unhealthy. This is really unusual in the severity of the crisis now. And campaign finance reform is very difficult since the Supreme Court declared that corporations are persons, mm -hmm. which everybody knows is ridiculous, and, uh, and they find loopholes to uh, circumvent the regulations. I think there is hope because in the longer term, the Internet-based forms of communication, which mm -hmm. do empower individual citizens, are going to become much more powerful. Before we talk about the Internet and its, and its role, um, there is some movement on the part of investors and activist investors in particular to encourage, urge companies to disclose their contributions to political groups. Do you think that's a good idea? And the SEC is suggesting that it may take this on and, in fact, require companies yeah. to do so. If investors can't do, it, do this by encouraging, should the SEC step in? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's hard to overturn the Citizens United case on corporate personhood and corporate contributions without a dramatic change in the makeup of the Supreme Court, which takes time and depends on the outcome of elections. Uh, perhaps a constitutional amendment, but we both know what a long and difficult route that is. So the SEC does have the authority to require such disclosure. I also hope that shareholders will continue this effort to get corporations uh, I whose shares they own uh, to be more responsible and sustainable. I advocate, along with my partner David Blood, with whom I co-founded Generation Investment Management, we, we fight for sustainable capitalism, uh, more openness and disclosure, but also a longer-term perspective, the, the alignment of incentives, accurate measurement of value, full integrated reporting to include environmental performance and the treatment of employees and communities where they operate. Uh, these reforms are really essential to make capitalism uh, work the way it was intended to work. And do you get the sense, though, that these reforms, potential reforms, are getting any traction, in the particularly in the, in the activist investor community? Yeah, I think they are. Uh, there's still an uphill push. Ironically, the United States is actually uh, behind Europe and some other parts uh, of the world. In many parts of the world, uh, we're seeing much more movement than in the U.S., but it's starting here, too. Mm -hmm. You've said that one of the things that we need to do to navigate this exponential change, as you put it, that yeah. we're seeing in the world, is simply to steer. Simply what? To steer. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, you know, the belief in the invisible hand is understandable. 
Uh, capitalism is the greatest force for economic transformation. It's caused many great positive benefits. But at, at its best, it has always been uh, married to appropriate regulation that lifts up the human values that are important to us. Protecting the environment, for example, prohibiting child labor, prohibiting the kind of abuses that led to the terrible tragedy in Bangladesh where they're still recovering bodies from that textile plant. So, so yes, I, I think it's really uh, important. I think that we're seeing some progress, but we need to see much more. And when I talk about exponential change, we've seen examples uh, of the American people and people around the world begin to beginning to think differently about a problem and then all of a sudden policies and laws change. Just look at what's happened in the last couple of years on gay marriage. Nobody would have thought such change was possible in such a short period of time. But the American people began to think differently about it and then it spread around the world. We saw that in the battle against apartheid and the struggle for civil rights and the collapse of the Berlin Wall and it can happen in these other areas. But where does the leadership come from? In well, this country specifically. It, it, it needs to come from our elected officials, of course, but some of these changes are so big they also have to come uh, from the bottom up. And I think, uh, to, just to re revisit the article, the uh, uh, example of gay rights, that really came when the conversation was won, when people began to understand that they had friends who were in the LGBT community and they started saying, hey, you know, they're really good people. Why are we discriminating against them? And in an earlier generation, that's exactly what happened with the civil rights revolution. And that's what I hope will happen, for example, on the climate crisis. Yeah. We're dumping 90 million tons of global warming pollution every day into the Earth's atmosphere as if it's an open sewer and it's threatening the destruction of the climate balance that has been essential to the flourishing of humankind. Are you concerned that the momentum on climate change has really shifted and decelerated, in fact? I think it's actually coming back in the other direction. There was a time immediately after the big financial crisis, mm -hmm. the Great Recession, as some called it, when the numbers dipped down. But it's been coming back very strongly in the past year and a half. One reason is the U.S. had $110 billion of climate-related disasters last year, including Superstorm Sandy, 61% yep. of the country uh, in drought, uh, the hottest year in the history of the United States. And the scientific community has made it plain that these are related to the warming of the earth and the global warming pollution from human beings that's causing it. Has has our investments, have our investors moved in, who have moved into green tech, Kleiner, for example, you know well, has that been a disappointment? Well, I, I think that it's a little bit of a roller coaster, and of course, uh, what happened after the big push into green tech is there was a perfect storm of four things. You had not only the Great Recession, you had a failure of policy on the part of the Congress and uh, internationally. You had the Chinese juggernaut pushing the cost of solar panels and windmills way down below the cost of production here in the U.S. And then you had the development of these massive shale gas reserves which pushed the price of electricity down. But in spite of that, we have seen in the last two years the aggregate global investments in renewable energy exceeding those in fossil fuels more in developing countries than in the advanced countries. And the cost of both solar and wind has been coming down relentlessly. That's going to continue. In many areas, it's now cheaper to produce electricity from solar and wind than it is from coal. So it, it's going to happen, but we need to accelerate it. All right, speaking of acceleration, I want to get your comment on a move in San Francisco. Um, the, the, there's a move by the pension funds to require the funds to divest itself of investments of companies that are major producers and owners of fossil fuels. Yeah. Is that an effective strategy? Yeah, I, I hope it will be. I support that move. You know, Seattle uh, uh, has already done it. Uh, there's a movement uh, all around the country. I've been talking about these subprime carbon assets for several years now. Bill McKibben has uh, organized an effort with 350.org to uh, push disinvestment, particularly on college campuses. I support that effort. 
not just because of the political objective, which I think is extremely important. It's a question of survival of civilization, ultimately. But it's also good business for these uh, investor groups and these pension funds to recognize that just as the subprime mortgages had an artificially high value that was bound to collapse, the subprime carbon assets are exactly the same way because we can't burn the 21 trillion of reserves in the ground. We just can't. It would destroy the future. And people know that. They're just banking on the fact that it'll be a few more years before governments come to their senses and say, hey, we can't continue destroying the future of humankind. Um, I got to talk a little bit of politics with you. You talk so much in your book about leadership and the U.S. needing to take a strong leadership role to, st role to steer the world through these changes. Yeah. Um, no, I'm not going to ask you if you would run for president again, but I am going to ask you about Hillary Clinton. Because she's someone, no sooner had that door closed behind her at the State Department than there were questions about whether she'd run for office. Do you think that in the Senate and then at State, she's demonstrated the kind of leadership qualities that prove she'd be an effective leader of the United States and be oh, able to steer I, us into I, I, I've worked with her, and of course, she's extremely uh, talented, capable of doing whatever she sets her mind to. But one of the problems we have in, in our culture in the United States and in our politics is that it's all about the horse race, even if the horse race doesn't start for another four years. I'll give you an example. We went through more televised debates in the presidential campaign last year, just a few months ago, uh, than ever in history, and not a single reporter asked a single question in any of the debates to any of the candidates about the climate crisis. But they asked all kinds of questions about who's up and who's down and what's the horse race and how's it going and this kind of thing. A and I think that we really have to engage with the substantive challenges that we have in, in, in our country. They will determine our future. There will be plenty of time for the horse race to get underway before the horse race analysis begins. Right. But by the way, which is why I asked you about her leadership qualities and whether she demonstra I mean, enough, whether she's demonstrated those. I, were you disappointed that with current you weren't able to change the conversation a little bit more and improve the quality and substance of television journalism? Well, I, I'm, I'm really proud of what my co-founder Joel Hyatt and I were able to do with current. Uh, we built a tremendous amount of value. We won most all of the significant awards in television journalism. We had an impact uh, on the debate in, in this country. I think, for example, the whole Occupy movement was really uh, lifted up by Countdown. Uh, and there are plenty of other examples. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons during that journey. Uh, and we did have to shift gears and go to Plan B. We had originally hoped to base the entire network on uh, viewer contributed uh, content or, or user generated as some people call it. And that had limited success and we had to shift to a news and commentary format. But again, it was very successful. We had a great outcome and I think the net result for the country is going to be very good. Great. Um, I need to ask you about some, some comments that Sandra Day, retired Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said yesterday when she said it was probably a mistake for the Supreme Court to take on Bush versus Gore. Were you surprised by that? Uh, well, in the sense that I didn't know she was going to say it, uh, yes. Uh, I made a decision in the immediate aftermath of the Supreme Court decision uh, 12, 13 years ago to respect the rule of law. Uh, I strongly disagreed with their opinion, said so. But the rule of law is really the bedrock of American democracy. There actually is no I intermediate step between a final Supreme Court decision and violent <laughs> revolution. So uh, what was best for the country? In my view, the answer to that question was very simple, and that is to respect the rule of law, avoid undermining it and dragging the court uh, into a partisan uh, uh, a squabble where the outcome would not change at all in any case. So uh, I'm going to stand by my decision to, to lift up the rule of law and the respect for the judiciary. We have about a minute left. 
you started this conversation by talking about our democracy has been hacked. What is the one message you want to send our viewers off with to actually gain control of our democracy again and get it back on a better Well, track? I see a big wheel turning. Uh, our, our nation was founded in the era of the printing press and individuals were empowered. In the, third, uh, in the last third of the 20th century, television, radio, broadcasting displaced the printing press. Now so many newspapers are in dear, deep trouble, as you know. Uh, and, and, and television uh, is not all like uh, Bloomberg. Uh, and if somebody wants to speak on television, uh, they have to have a lot of money, typically. Uh, now, the, the wheel is turning again. And when the Internet becomes uh, more dominant, television still dominant, but when the Internet continues to rise, individuals will once again have an opportunity to influence the course of policy and events. So I think it's really important to speed up the movement of our democratic institutions onto the Internet.